starting and let's get going all right what's up everybody welcome to the k podcast we are back and we are here with josh thomas and josh thomas is the host of the homegrown mma show which is a mixed martial arts podcast on apple spotify and i'm assuming everywhere josh yeah, everywhere podcasts are sold. Cool, cool. Are you on YouTube too? I'm actually not. I've been. Uh, I am on YouTube, but not in the podcast space. Just in the uh, drinking and partying, and <laughs> you know that kind of space. Just uh, uh, recording your memories and keeping them up there. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it started. Uh, I teach jujitsu, and it started. I wanted to tase my brother one night during class, so uh, I made this whole video of me going around our small ass town in Appalachia and uh, trying to buy a taser. And then the end of the video, I mean, I tased the fuck out of him, <laughs> so it wasn't clickbaity at all. But that was like my foray into uh, YouTube. That what city is that? Oh, what state is that? That city, Apple, Apple. Uh, I just say Appalachia just because it covers the whole wide range. But I'm from um, I'm from a small little town called Damascus, but nobody's ever heard of that. So uh, I just say like the Appalachian Mountain area of Virginia, but it's all like white okay. trashy and shit. <laughs> That's hey, funny. Man, got that jiu-jitsu going. <laughs> it's funny how sometimes the fun videos that you know you just film for the whim of it are the ones that gain momentum and and click with people. <laughs> Is that how that happens? Yeah, there's an audience. There's always right. somebody who wants to watch. It's like the less you try at something, the more you fun you have with it. The universe yeah, recognizes that, that somehow. <laughs> so you teach jujitsu as well, Josh? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm an active uh, competitor. I actually, I fight two times in November. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, once in like a week, uh, twice in November, and then uh, Worlds in December, actually. And I coach full time. How long does it usually take you to train to, uh, to train for these fights? Um, I mean, I've I've taken fights on like two days notice before. Um, oh God! For okay. for the most part, I, I like like a full six weeks. Because um, the fucking the Oh, can I cuss? Yeah, go ahead, man. Sure. The oh, fucked yeah. up thing about jujitsu right now is like everybody has their own different fucking rule set, so you almost uh, more so have to train for the rule set as opposed to like actual fights. Hmm. And like, what I mean by that is like some uh, like ADCC just happened. Uh, I don't know if you guys keep up with with like the gra- uh, grappling uh, world, but mm-hmm. so ADCC is like our Olympics, and so in ADCC you have. Uh, essentially a 10 minute match where the first five minutes no points could be scored and in the remaining five minutes points can be scored and the reason they do this is so you're uh, more apt to try to get a finish in the first five minutes Uh, Uh, but then if you go do something like EBI you have a 10 minute fight and then if if nobody's finished uh, the other person uh, there's no submission uh it'll go to what's called ebi overtime and so you start in these positions uh which is like a rear naked choke like a like a back take you'll start in a fully locked up back take or you'll start in like it's called spider web but it's like an arm bar position mm-hmm. and uh it's like fastest escape wins so some organizations have adopted the ebi rules where if you or at a stalemate at the end of your match, you uh, jump into these quote-unquote EBI overtime rules, which is pretty shitty because um, if I get on somebody's back in a fight, I'm going to choke them the fuck out. Right. Or if I get a hold of their arm, I'm, I'm going to finish the fight. Uh, and if I can't, then giving me this position and then saying, okay, whoever escapes this position fastest is the winner is just it's asinine in a way. Yeah. It's not really a... It doesn't really summarize, really yeah, as far as, like, skill. You don't really get to see who the better fighter is based on that sudden death predicament. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so, what what kind of, uh, I know there's different styles of jiu-jitsu. There's, uh, you know, there's the more traditional gi practitioners. Because I'm from SoCal, so there's, I see different styles of it. There's the Gracie style. There's the 10th um, planet style, you know. 
Um, as far as your style of jujitsu, what what kind of what would you say your your style of jujitsu would technically be? Uh, I came from American wrestling. I wrestled my entire life. Uh, and then when I first started jujitsu, I was at a school that was a Tom DeBloss jujitsu school, which is a, a mixture of gi and no gi. And I left there and went to 10 Planet for a while. And then now, uh, teaching my own curriculum, uh, I would say we're probably more in the American jiu jitsu style of fighting, where it's more uh, wrestling heavy grappling exchanges. Um, I mean, I. I don't do any gi whatsoever. I competed in the gi not too long ago just to fucking, just to do it. Um, it was like a little team bonding thing because all my guys competed in the gi that day. Um, but for me, like myself, I don't I don't touch the gi ever. I'm strictly no gi. Nice. Uh, how, how much did uh, wrestling help you when you first started doing jujitsu? Oh, man. Uh <laughs> I actually, I got into jujitsu because when I was 18 years old, um, I fucking yeeted college. I was just like, I'm fucking, I'm out. Uh, and so I wanted like a way to compete. And so I actually went back to the high school I graduated from and I taught wrestling. And one of the kids' dads was like this fucking Jack 250, like tatted up dude. And he was like, just come do MMA with me. And I was like, yeah, sure. So yes, sir. I went in. Yeah, so I went in, and uh, they had this pro fighter. He was, like, 155 pounds, so he was, like, just barely bigger than me, and he was a kickboxer. And uh, the school that I first started with was a Stephen Thompson, like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson affiliate school. So it was, like, a lot of kickboxers. And they were like, yeah, he's fighting a wrestler. Do you know how to wrestle? And I was like, yeah. Well, yeah, I know. (laughs) They they gave me a fucking – they gave me headgear and and gloves, and they were like, all right, take him down. Oh. Like, my intro to MMA was, like, leaning really heavy on my wrestling uh, to the point where it was, like, almost detrimental because I would just get the shit beat out of me and I would just take people down. So when I... Take me to the ground, like, at least. <laughs> yeah, I was like, fuck this, dude. So <laughs> when I first started doing, like, actual jiu-jitsu, I, like, still had that mentality of, like, I'm going to get fucked up if I don't take this person down. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, jiu-jitsu, there's no strikes in fucking jiu-jitsu. So it was... Yeah. But... Uh, I lean on it heavy, like heavy, heavy. Most of my matches, I engage takedowns. Uh, I don't get taken down very often. That's awesome. So you've you've competed. You went straight into, as far as competing goes, you started out jujitsu, or you started out wrestling, obviously. Then you went to jujitsu, and then you went to MMA, or did you go MMA and then I went to MMA. Yeah, I went MMA first and then to uh, jiu-jitsu. I actually, I had an accident a couple years ago. Um, I, w- I was working for the highway at the time, and a fucking sign broke loose, swung and hit me, Sheesh. and cleaned in the face. And uh, I was scheduled to make a, um, like a pro debut, a pro MMA debut, and it fucked my teeth up. So I had to sit oh, on God. the sidelines for like six months while I got my teeth fixed. And after that, I, my daughter was born, and uh, from wrestling alone um like i grew up wrestling like i never stopped Mm -hmm. um so i had about eight concussions ish and uh once my daughter was born i was like yeah fuck fuck fighting dude i'm just gonna dominate people grappling and not worry about getting my fucking face punched in you know what i mean right jeez so wrestling. i left mma to I'm sorry. I left MMA to go full time into jujitsu, pretty much. Okay, so I, you're probably in some positions where you hold back like a little palm strike, maybe that you see open. <laughs> maybe some elbows that you can drop. Down we uh, like, nah, we're grappling. <laughs> we we uh, we're actually getting ready for like combat jujitsu. Um, actually, Alicia Zapatella, she trains with us. Uh, it's my girlfriend. Mm. Oh no way. She's a uh, for. Former Invicta um, Adam Weight champ, but she has uh, Medusa Combat Jiu Jitsu this weekend actually. So lately, we've been palm striking the fuck out of everybody <laughs> at the gym. Like, we'll take them down and just fucking whack the shit out. But it's all in good fun. Like, we're a big family. So, so everyone what is palm striking? You say what? What what is palm striking? Oh, this my like, an o- here, but... like an like an open palm strike. Andrew, like, have you heard of Combat yeah. Jiu Jitsu? Say I have no. <laughs> what is that, bro? I think I mean you'd probably agree, Josh, because 
Some people would say what differentiates people training gi jujitsu over no gi jujitsu is no gi jujitsu is more practical, right? Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, I would say that combat jujitsu is the purest form of jujitsu because you can't really stall in any certain pin positions. So, combat jujitsu essentially is jujitsu, jujitsu, but palm strikes are allowed. So, you can strike someone with an open palm. So, you could literally weigh someone with a knockout haymaker with an open palm, or just like you know, just bitch slap them while they're. You have them in like rubber guard like or something. Like, you can like slap them or something. I'm like, okay. I mean, no fist. I get it. slap is you, friendly, you but people guy? like people go crazy sometimes with, with the palm strikes. People slap slide out there. Are you a tenth planet guy? Because that rubber guard comment <laughs> just that made my soul happy. <laughs> no, I'm, I, you know what? I'm not, but I have to say, um, the tenth planet style is more is flashier, so it it excites. I'd say more of the casuals. Um, I actually, I actually kind of like more of the. Um, I, I've been I've been liking Mike Museshi style lately. Kind of just kind of holds you and grinds you down. Oh, yeah. But I, I I'd say I've been fascinated with wrestling more the wrestling style lately. But I I got into it late. I'm like 33 now, so I feel like really diving deep into the art of wrestling would probably be detrimental for my knees at this age. Because I know that's the number one thing. The knees in the back is the number one injury when it comes to wrestling, right? Absolutely. Uh, my brother actually, so my brother got a late start. My brother just turned 32. Uh, or sorry, 31. Uh, fuck, he's probably listening. He's probably like, what an asshole. Um, <laughs> my brother just turned 31. He actually started uh, November of last year uh, was his his uh, beginning of jiu-jitsu training. So... You're never too old, man. Like, we have a guy, uh, or excuse me, had a guy at my old gym that was 56, and he was a fucking purple belt, and he would smash everybody in there. Hmm. That's crazy. So you're never too old, but yeah, the, the knees in the back go first, man. My knees fucking hurt all the time. Mm-hmm. I've been, um, I've been training jujitsu for, like, maybe five, six years, but inconsistently. So I'm still a white belt. But I have like four or five years of white belt experience, so I'm not, I'm like a gray belt, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, that white belt's definitely, definitely stained. Yeah, like a pinkish belt. <laughs> um, but something for me, because I, I, I predominantly train striking over grappling, just because I feel like grappling, I do like the fact that you can kind of go 100% when it comes to rolling and sparring. And you'd come out of it less damaged than if you went 100% striking sparring. But at the same time, I feel like it's a grind more when you're... Let's say if you're in the gym seven days a week. If you're doing sparring, or not sparring, striking training, where you're just hitting pads or you're sparring to where you can dictate the pace, dictate the distance, opposed to, you know, spending five rounds fighting from, like, half guard from this you know this monster on top of you i feel like it's it's a little more um less taxing on your joints and your body doing more striking training than grappling training as far as for me so that's kind of why i've 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 been more inclined to do striking training over the grappling training but as as a person who's been more into grappling than striking what kind of advice would you give someone who's kind of obsessed with grappling but wants to avoid the injuries that comes along with immersing yourself in the training um you know i'm i'm kind of with you because uh when i first started mma like i fell in love with like putting hands on people Mm -hmm. so uh i was i was a muay thai coach actually for a couple years Um, wow and i i love all aspects of fighting i would say that uh if you're trying to not get hurt grappling uh I would definitely try to find maybe two to three ish people in your gym that you can really level with and just say, Hey, I have a job. I have a nine to five. I have kids, whatever. I can't get hurt because that's kind of the way it is. Like with my guys, like, like my brother, for instance, my brother, uh, and, and me too. Uh, but we both have kids and we both still have a nine to five. 
Um, so if we get hurt, I mean, that's money out of our bank accounts and that's food out of our kids' mouths. So, Mm -hmm. um, unless I'm training for a competition, I always tell my guys like, Hey, just don't, don't fucking try to kill each other in here, but, but make sure you get the work you need. And there's also a difference in people that are training to compete or they're training for self-defense or self-confidence or whatever. So for the most part, I would say find like-minded people and try to mesh with those people really well. That's awesome. That's lucky for you because um, you have a brother, and you guys are both into it. So, you guys, I mean, there's a difference sparring with a friend who's almost like a brother and a brother compared to just like you know, someone you're cool with at the gym. I feel like that brotherly yeah. relationship. They know you can go a little bit harder than your forty percent. You know, you guys can turn up sixty percent safely. Maybe touch the seventy, eighty percent range. Um, <laughs> Um, my, I, my brother actually he sneak attacks me all the time <laughs> he's, he's bigger than me he's like 180 yeah. pounds and he just jumps on my back anytime he can like between rolls like if I'm looking at somebody else he'll just run up and jump on me <laughs> and he's like what are you going to do now and I'm like man I got to get this goddamn backpack off of me first like <laughs> yeah. that's funny. for the real world yeah <laughs> that's what it is I, um, I grew up with cousins and um Growing up, we we were obsessed with WWF, WWE, so we were used to like you know having the younger this this the youngest cousin watch the door, while the older cousins go at it, and you know whoever cries is a bitch. You know what I mean? <laughs> so crazy. Like years later, um, they got into jujitsu, they got into boxing. So I was able to find sparring partners in the family that are already doing their thing. I feel like that's a blessing, you know. It is hard to find training partners you can fully trust. And it's a luxury to have family that are involved in the team, too. So that's pretty cool. Is your brother a fighter as well? Absolutely. No, he um, he's mainly in it just for the love of the sport. Um, he, he, we grew up watching uh, the UFC, like, when it first became mainstream. I remember... Uh, my dad standing in front of the TV uh, when Spike TV was live for the Forrest Griffin uh, Stephen Bonner fight. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so I I remember that, and so we were we were both just kind of like immersed in it uh, throughout our teenage years. And um, he actually my very first fight he was my corner, and uh, he never he never trained at all. He just he was my corner, and I I told him exactly what I needed from him. I was like, I don't need you fucking yelling shit. I don't need you <laughs> anything but giving me water in between rounds. Like it's all you got to do, bro. And it's just it's comforting having uh, having him around because he's been around for my entire career now, from my very first fight. To, uh, I mean, he'll he'll be with me at Worlds in December. So, mm-hmm. um, but he he doesn't fight. He's uh, he's older than me. He uh, he had a kid way before I did, and she's. In, into the, like the teenage years and um so she keeps him really busy um he competes jujitsu wise every now and again but um he's more in it for the love of the sport and and the self-growth and, and i think we've grown as brothers through it too so it's uh, super beneficial for our family that's for sure um Sorry, dude. I fucking I ramble. I hit the fucking joint a minute ago. That's mine, dude. Dude, I got the bong over here, so <laughs> I'm like waiting to reach it. It's too far. Um, so you've been in you've been you've been in a UFC and the MMA from the get go. Like, I'd say majority of the fans. I, it has to be post Conor McGregor. Like, there was no one else that brought a storm of fans into the UFC. Um, I came in during the uh, Anderson Silva wave, and I feel like there was another wave hey. during the Brock Lesnar phase. And the then, Lesnar phase. I think that's what I... Which is incredible. Like, I, I just started getting into wrestling again and watching Brock Lesnar and be like, dude, as you guys clown wrestling, but that dude was a heavyweight champ. It's fucking pretty badass that he did that mm. in the UFC too. Um, but the Conor McGregor phase, I felt like brought he he he's opened up the floodgates for the casual UFC fans. Um, how do you feel about? I mean, especially like the Nelk boys right now coming out with like their own MMA channel and stuff. How do you feel about 
I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, how do you feel about... I mean, as for me personally, it's kind of irritating, but I want to know how you feel about, like, casuals that are now coming out with their own hot takes on, on, the, on the sport based on the little experience and observation that they've seen. Uh... <sighs> I, it's a two-part answer because when I first started watching the sport, it was like it's a little bitty corner of the internet, mm-hmm. and I mean it was on it was on Spike TV, and you had fucking Mansers and Deadliest <laughs> Warrior and, yeah. and UFC. You know what I mean? So right. when I first started watching, it was like this little bitty corner of the internet on SureDog dot com. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. I still use SureDog. <laughs> I fuck with sure dog. Um, but it was just this little bitty this little bitty culture in the corner of the internet and now thanks to the Ronda Rouseys, the Conor McGregors, now the fucking Sean O'Malley's, it's blowing up to new heights. And it it's weird being a longtime fan and seeing all these guys that you know came over during the Conor McGregor era and they just have these really shitty takes. Mm. And so I see all these shitty takes on the internet and I'm just like, Oh man, this is fucking terrible. But then I think of, I have fucking 18, 19 year old kids that I train who literally like they don't know what they want to do for their career. They just, they're in the gym training seven fucking days a week. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. Like love them or hate them. The Conor McGregor's, the Ronda Rousey's like they put asses in gyms. It's true too. As a, like as a coach and as a, um, the guy who will always advocate for martial arts and mixed martial arts and uh, just the self-defense aspect of martial arts and the self-confidence aspect, I love that. I love that gyms are fucking packed now. And I honestly, it, it's cringy when you see a guy that wants to be like Conor McGregor so bad and, and they're talking all this shit as like an amateur fighter. But at the same time, I'm just like, you know what? Like that kid's fucking in a gym, man. Like that kid's helping pay somebody's bills. He's helping keep the lights on in a gym with 20 other people that are there for the love of the sport. So it's it's a double-sided, it's a double-edged sword because I'm getting tired of seeing their shitty takes on Twitter. <laughs> but it is awesome that they're helping bring people out of the woodwork to start training. So it's, you know, it's up in the air. I feel you. That's the, um, I feel like that's, that's what they mean by good or bad publicity is good publicity. Yep. You know? It doesn't matter yeah. what, what it is bad or good as long as as we're on the headlines people are talking about is it's gonna be good for the sport um yeah i mean you look at adcc i'm sorry no go ahead go ahead uh you look at adcc 2022 um just recently happened this is the biggest adcc in adcc history and you gotta almost think that gordon ryan is the reason of that uh, because Gordon Ryan is essentially our Conor McGregor in the jiu-jitsu world. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's more like our Conor McGregor and our George St. Pierre and, and our John Jones all mixed <laughs> together. You know, he's, Gordon Gordon's the true goat of, of grappling, but you almost have to wonder if Gordon is the reason for this newfound love of ADCC that used to be in fucking high school gyms in Beijing and, and – uh, now it just fucking sold out the Thomas Mack Arena in uh, Las Vegas, and it, we're 2024 going to be back in Las Vegas too. So you got to wonder if like those people are just good for the sport because they bring so many people to the sport that eventually try the sport. That's the that's also the cool thing about it because it's not one sport that's being heavily inflated. Like not everyone's just going to MMA and be like. Oh. You go to jujitsu. That's why don't you just do MMA? You know what I mean. Like everyone is kind of finding their own branch of uh, martial arts, and I feel like martial arts wins as a whole instead of MMA just kind of being a monopoly for the new students and and the new people, which is pretty cool. Because um, it's interesting seeing people. You know, you, right now a lot of people are getting into boxing. Um, and you could attribute that to Jake Paul and and all the YouTubers starting to get into boxing. But at the same time, you know, going through social media, you see some people starting to get into jujitsu, people getting into kickboxing, some people just as MMA as a whole. So as a person who is a fan of martial arts, that's also cool to see that 
You know, it's not just I train UFC, bro. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> We're not just wearing affliction shirts anymore. <laughs> For real. I had a couple of affliction shirts. Hey, I still have one. I still have one. Those those bitches are fire, dude. Don't let anybody tell you wrong. That's funny. So you said um you've taken you've also taken short notice fights. Like two days notice? That's wild. Yeah. Dude. Yeah, two days notice, uh yeah. Two things, man. You're either fucking crazy or you you stay ready. <laughs> or both. Always stays, <laughs> stay, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. But no, go. I mean it's uh, you're being like streamed on like a platform like Flow Grappling or uh, if there's like any sort of pay per view and people are gonna buy it. Mm-hmm. In short notice is fucking great, dude. Like fuck it, there's low expectations for one, um, which I I don't I don't like the excuse of like low expectations because I just feel like it's a built-in excuse in a way, but it is kind of low expectations because you're just supposed to show up and just perform. So I, on short notice, I've always just had more fun. I've been, I've done riskier shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I've, uh, I fought twice and man, I think I was more nervous for my first fight, but then my second fight, I won my first fight. So my second fight was the little, you know, a little too sure of myself, and I ended up losing. <laughs> yeah. So you know, being being nervous and having those pre pre jitters sometimes could be beneficial, but at the same time, it could hurt you. So going in short notice, you're just like kind of kill or be killed attitude. Whatever, what happens happens. I feel like that could be an edge. Too. I didn't even have time to think about the fight. <laughs> I didn't have time to think about the fight. I just had to like cut the weight, and then by the time I weighed Dang. in, I was like, oh, it's time to fucking go. Like. It's crazy. Um, as far as making weight goes and being a coach, uh, what do you think is optimal as far as being fight ready goes? Would you say um, just being ready and training and being around weight or being that you're walking around weight, getting the fight camp and then going hard and tapering off maybe like 10, 15 pounds and then getting into weight that way opposed to just being in your weight? Uh, I, I don't think any of uh, I don't think any of our team right now really cuts a lot of weight. I think we have another uh, the owner of the gym. Uh, he's a, he coaches gi jiu jitsu. Um, I think he might cut just a little bit, but it's normally like five or so pounds, if if anything. Uh, for the most part, we just fight around our walk around weight because, um, I mean, I wrestled my whole life. I, I I don't I don't like weight cutting at all. I don't I don't think it's. I don't think it's safe. I mean, I understand why it's there. I understand why it's in place, but I don't think being a fucking 15, 16 year old kid and cutting weight is healthy at all. No, for sure. Um, but I mean, I have grown adults who can do whatever they want. I just always advise them to just stay around their, their weight. Um, which kind of sucks because my brother, like I said, is about 180. He got some fucking guys that cut to 180 uh, in his first ever uh, tournament. And it was, I mean, you can tell. I mean, they're fucking. <laughs> Like they look like fucking heavyweights and I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure their muscles had muscles and um, it was just I mean you can tell who really cuts weight but I mean we, we have clean ass technique like we make sure that we um, like I I come from wrestling so I of course prefer like the top position mm-hmm. the last two or three weeks I've been teaching a lot from like, bottom half guard or like bottom Z guard mm-hmm. so like the guys are essentially like dangerous from everywhere, if that makes sense. So in the event they were to get somebody bigger that can put them on the on the back foot or put them on the ground, put them on their back, they're still pretty uh, pretty savvy from from the back. So I don't know. We just stay ready, and um, I don't I don't like cutting weight. So I I tell all my guys to just do everything the safe way. And, and you know if you give up a couple pounds or you give up a little bit of strength, we're gonna make it up in technique. And. If, if someone does have to cut weight, maybe like, let's say someone's cutting 10 pounds, um, do you have a refeed regimen that you put your fighters through? Because I know there's a right way to refeed. You can't just go like to fucking In-N-Out or McDonald's and eat up. Well, I would have done. <laughs> Bro, can I, can I be honest? The last fight that I had... Um Actually, I fucking like refueled with like a Publix. Like, do you guys have Publix? Are you are you East Coast? You're not East Coast. We're West Coast. 
What's Publix? Okay, so uh, Publix has like these subs, and they're so fucking good, dude. Uh, so I refueled with like a 12 inch fucking Publix sub and <laughs> like a monster, and my body felt like shit. Um, we always bring Pedialyte, so like we always have Pedialyte so the guys can get their electrolytes or whatever. Um, and then after that, like we try to keep them eating light until maybe the day of the event, and they can kind of eat a little bit freer. But if they're mm-hmm. cutting anything over like five ish pounds, I would say to to take it very very slow. Yeah, because if you're not, you're it's just just gonna bloat, and you're just gonna feel even fucking worse, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially if it's a same day weigh in. I mean, I I, I learned the hard way. I my second fight, I, my team was pretty much just some homies that <laughs> some some dude just doing karate in the garage. You know what I mean? And yeah, <laughs> made the way and was like, hey, let's fucking go eat. So just brunched out at a fucking munched out at some brunch place. And yeah, I felt bloated that night. It's not good. <laughs> I wish you gotta I knew. Wonder though. Wish I knew. You got you got you got to wonder though. Like guys, like you mentioned him a minute ago, uh, Mikey Musumichi. Mm-hmm. He only yeah. eats like pasta and pizza. So you have to wonder. I mean, it must just be everybody's body's different and they react in different ways. So yeah, I always do, I go light, man. Good point. That I go, is true. I go super light. I go salads. I go fucking unseasoned chicken like i just i'd play it as safe as possible because i'm not trying to have a fucking stomach ache while i gotta wrestle fuck somebody you know Mm-hmm. so um during i'd say off season when you don't have a fight schedule right during off season what's your uh what's the training regimen like in comparison to when you are in go mode and it's camp time um i don't really know because this year um this year I've not had an off season. Um, I pulled my groin last year in November. Sheesh. It bothered me until like April. So then April Dang. I flew out. I flew out to Vegas, did high rollers, and then since uh, April I've had something or two somethings or three somethings like every single month since. So, Damn. Um, I'm so. Um, this month, the 29th, I have a, I think it's like an eight-man tournament or some shit. And then in November, I have another eight-man tournament, uh, like an absolute tournament. So I'd, I'll be giving up like a lot of weight. And at the end of November, I have a like a 135-pound fight. And in December is going to be Worlds. January is going to be back in Vegas for High Rollers, uh, the wrestling tournament that they're doing. And then February, uh, I will have like a decent little break so i think come february i'll probably only coach probably like not because right now like i stay late and get rolls in with my guys like i make sure everybody's taken care of um like 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 rolling wise technique wise whatever like i'll spend like like i'll finish class and i'll still be there an hour and a half later like just sitting with the guys Mm -hmm. so i think come february i'll probably be finishing class and then getting the fuck out of the gym (laughs) I can I can go home and fucking binge Netflix or something, but yeah, stop being a warrior for a little bit. <laughs> I've not I've not had a break in so long. They're like now, like my breaks are like two weeks long, and then it's like back in fucking fight mode. Mm-hmm. That's nuts, man. I'm gonna take my daughter to Disney World, so that's I'm just any fucking card. I don't care where it's at, as long as it's East Coast, dude. I've been going. <laughs> I went to New York, New Jersey. I went to Disneyland recently, so bro, don't don't expect to rest at Disney World. It's fucking. Oh, not at all. That, that place is a workout <laughs> as well. <laughs> Good cardio, fun it's cardio. So it was like really small. Me and my ex-wife took her. Um, we went to Disney Springs in uh, like Orlando, Florida. Sorry, I had a cat run through the house. Um, <laughs> I took her to Disney Springs in like in like uh, Orlando, Kissimmee, Florida, whatever whatever it's called. Um, it was super nice, but yeah, I'm definitely she's older now and she's like super into everything Disney, so I already know like we're gonna get our fucking steps in for the day. <laughs> That's funny. So on top of this, how did um how'd you go about getting your podcast started? 
Um, actually, when I had my accident a couple of years ago, I was getting ready for a bare knuckle fight. No, dude, you're fucking crazy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> And so when I got hurt, I told them, I was like, hey, like, I've, I'm fucked up. And they were like, well, um, do you want to do, like, media or something? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I started interviewing bare knuckle fighters. Because mm. I, I had a podcast called The Takedown back in the day. And uh, it went from, like, interviewed bare knuckle fighters to, like, fucking porn stars and shit. Mm. Nice. And I quit that and uh, pursued, me and my brother have a podcast called the weekly forecast um and it's like super popular it was like trending on itunes a couple times or apple whatever a couple times and um like it was like pretty big and then i started a podcast like in like november or december maybe something like that and it was called the homegrown podcast or homegrown the podcast is is how it's like titled mm-hmm. um and it it started trending like hard and I do like I talk mainly like history because I'm like a fucking nerd dude like mm-hmm. I'm not at the gym or like with my daughter I'm just like listening to history podcasts or fucking history audiobooks dude yeah and uh so it's like mainly history and then I was like fuck I want to talk MMA but there's a lot of people on this platform that just don't get into MMA so right. I started the homegrown MMA show just so I could talk about MMA and, and be a fucking MMA nerd that's like the long form uh explanation that's dope yeah man um we just started this podcast too and i was thinking like it before we got it started i was thinking i'm i mean we're our interests are all fucking around like golf movies mma conspiracy theories spirituality so i'm like how the fuck i put something out that's that reaches so many interests but somehow be organized you know so you're just like, fuck it, a podcast should be able to encapsulate everything and still be, you know, <laughs> some 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 way a way to organize all interests into into one one show or channel. So uh we actually had a, a YouTube uh, historian a, a historian with a YouTube channel on our podcast maybe like a few weeks ago and do like yeah, we nerded out cuz um we have we have a bunch of gamers in our team too, so a bunch of us fucking loved Assassin's Creed, so we we're just nerding out about Assassin's Creed and like history. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, um, do you only get into MMA in your podcast, or are you just starting out with MMA and then you're eventually going to get into other topics? Uh, so Homegrown, the podcast, is where I talk about everything else, and then the Homegrown MMA show is now just strictly MMA. So. Mm. I actually handwrite my show notes like during the week of like everything I want to talk about on grown and then um like fights that are relevant that week i'll take and i'll make a separate page and i'll write down and like what i want to talk about on the homegrown mma show so i keep them separate uh, like i like i have all the logins like i i own both podcasts i guess but i just keep them very separated just so i can keep my audiences separated i guess right, because I for me like for me like my mom listens to both I and mean, my mom's of course like unfortunately became an MMA fan <laughs> um, but like my mom listens to both and like I have a lot of friends that aren't in the MMA space but they're still interested in what in the goddamn fuck is this cat doing <laughs> um, I have to figure this out I'm sorry no handle um, I have a lot of friends that are interested in like relevant topics or history or whatever and they're just not into MMA so I, I felt like at first I was trying to like section like where I talked about MMA mm. it, it started becoming like a thing where I would put it at the end of episodes but then it's like all my MMA guys have to wait and listen to me talk 20 minutes about fucking World War 2 <laughs> or like something like that you know so I just I felt like it would be almost more inclusive if I just separated them I feel you. Yeah, I mean, like, I thought about that, just making, like, a gaming section, uh, movie section, sports section, but I just am too impatient, dude. <laughs> and plus, I, 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 suck with, I suck with um, remembering and memorizing all my passwords, so... I'll fucking lose an account or two if I do that. 
I will say I uh, I used to write for um, a website. It was called the Baseline Times, and I was one of their MMA analysts. Mm. And what they what they done was they had a website, so you could go to baselinetimes dot com or whatever. And then from there, they had baseline MMA, they had baseline golf, baseline football, almost the way Barstool does it, how Barstool separates everything. And then you can click the link and it takes you to that, mm. um, like that page almost, or that, that podcast or whatever. So with, with Cave, if you have two or three other guys that want a podcast, you just like donate the football side of shit to them. And it's still under the same network, which is how we done it at, at Baseline. So like Baseline itself, was like a network and then i would do baseline mma there's a guy named cody he would do baseline nfl or or whatever so if you look it up on apple you can click baseline like the network and it shows you all their channels mm, um, okay. and then same with like their their youtube they had everything sectioned off on the youtube um and i eventually want to get to that point where i have the homegrown network then I have homegrown history, homegrown MMA, homegrown movies, or the whatever. Whoever wants right. to fuck, you know what I mean? Take notes, Andrew. Write that down. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got the screen recording right now. Hey. <laughs> Say that again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's funny. Um, dude, that's awesome. Uh, I was going to talk something about conspiracy, World War II. Before I get into the breakdown, oh, okay. I'm super into conspiracies. Um, nice. <laughs> just started <laughs> watching. I've, I've been looking for this show, but it is finally on Hulu, so I was able to watch the first episode of it. Um, I think it's called Hunting Hitler or Chasing Hitler. Yeah. Bro, is he alive or what? <laughs> no, you want to you want to know the this the. I mean, it's not a sad fact. I have Jewish family, so fuck Hitler. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, so Hitler actually, when he was in his bunker, right, he has this, these, these gang of people with him in the bunker and they're all going to commit suicide. Right. So when they actually opened up the bunker, they said it smelled like, uh, like almonds or whatever, which is the way that, um, uh, sorry, cyanide smells. Right. So, Mm. uh, essentially what had happened was everybody committed suicide except for Hitler and one other man. And Hitler tells this guy, he says, Hey, grab the radio and radio out to the German soldiers that I was killed in the line of battle. So Hitler's friend or whoever the fuck this guy is does that. He says, hey, uh, Hitler has been killed fighting the Allied forces at the front of the battle or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So then Hitler fucking kills himself. He wanted he wanted in history for himself to have this honorable right. quote-unquote uh, like... Samurai yeah, death so he, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, he, he he fucking he swallowed that shit dude and fucking croaked good riddance dude Jeez. the little Nicky the little Nicky portrayal of fucking <laughs> Hitler where he's in hell with the fucking tits on his head you know <laughs> yeah it's a pineapple he's just taking pineapples up the ass yeah <clears throat> <laughs> yeah it's wild um do you ever I mean since we're on the topic of conspiracy theory and I wanna I wanna dedicate a whole fucking episode to Antarctica alone, but what are your thoughts on Antarctica? Is there more to it than, um, than just glaciers and penguins? In, in what aspect? So, um, like I said, I don't want to go deep into it unless we go deep into it, but people say, first of all, it's as mysterious because it's one of the few lands that the whole world agreed to leave alone and dedicate to science. Like even the Nazis were in the greens for it. But people say that, um, first of all, Antarctica is just as big as, the, as America. And in the center of it, the climate starts to warm up. And there's a whole inner earth civilization in there that, that people say the Nazis ran away to and laid base after the World War yep. II. Is that where Hitler's at? Well, they said that he had a stopover in Argentina and then potentially yeah, ran off to Antarctica. <laughs> that was a layover. Yeah. Oh, dude, he, was, he was trying to get that Central American fucking energy supply. Yep. <laughs> um, do you guys believe in Pangea? Um, you know what? I think it makes sense. 
Pangea is, is the plates moving around, right? And it used to be it's all the countries used to, all used, to, used to be all the countries used to be one one land. Well, um, like they say that, but what is it South America doesn't exactly fit in Africa as if you really actually put it together. That's what I. You know what? Remember. With the thought process of taking islands into account, though, it would though. Yeah, they they fit you perfect. Think of all the like islands. islands. Mm hmm. You know In what? Theory. I'm not. I'm not. Sure. I mean, believe it. I wasn't more. there. I, I I would say yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, but for some reason, thinking about it right now, I'm thinking maybe no. <laughs> like the I like the idea of Pangea because with with uh, like with that theory, um, essentially we were connected to the Soviet Union at one point. So Russia would be touching uh, modern day Alaska, mm. case which is where uh, the Bering Strait and the Bering mm -hmm. Land Sea Bridge. Apparently, we had a lot of people. Uh, I say we, but apparently there was a lot of people that came from like that Siberian out of the world that walked the Bering Strait into Alaska. Right. Um, so if you think about that, if you think about that, um, you think of Pangea. Antarctica might have been a civilization that just, uh, during the shifting of tectonic plates, just had no way of uh, leaving, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say. I mean, Antarctica's fucking cold, dude. And you think of, like, Siberia, like modern-day Russia. It's cold as fuck. Um, so cold that when the French invaded the Soviet Union... Uh, I mean, after they got their shit pushed in, they had to walk all the way fucking back in, like, one of the worst winters in fucking Russian history, and half of them fucking died on the walk, not even the the actual battle itself. I mean, it takes a harsh person to live in that kind of climate. Um, so, I mean, if there is a civilization there, I mean, those are some tough fucking people, and I don't think we want to find them. <laughs> Which is a beautiful segue. What the fuck is <laughs> up with the Russians and MMA, bro? And, like, is it Dagestan uh, primarily, or is it just all of Russia? Um, yeah, I mean, we have people like, uh, like Valentina Shevchenko from, um, oh, man. She actually trains at the gym I came from in Florida, and, and they're going to be so mad if I don't remember where she's from. <laughs> she's from somewhere, though. Um, and then you have, like, guys like Yuri from, like, Eerie's from uh, from that that side of the world, and, and um, you Kamzat's originally from Chechnya. I mean, they just you could argue that uh, they're just tougher people over there. But I mean, it's obvious they figured out the wrestling and the sambo aspect to a point where I think if you look at like throughout times, like the Dutch really perfected kickboxing, or the Thais really perfected Thai boxing. Um, Hmm. I think that Russians are just, I mean, they're perfecting wrestling, whereas, uh, you know, jiu-jitsu started in Japan and then made its way to to Brazil and then it evolved into this Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is now uh, coming to America and, and branching off into American jiu-jitsu. So it's almost like um, different uh, geographic regions perfect Mm -hmm. different art than others i guess and that's kind of what it looks like with russia and, and dagestan in particular because they had uh abdulmanop uh, habib's dad kind of running the wrestling program and um habib actually won uh naga nogi worlds actually in 2012 i think um and he was putting his samba sambo against jiu-jitsu so i mean they, they they figured it out grappling wise yeah it's nuts i mean with that said, would you would you say that's evidence? And what do you think about the uh, idea that if you're going to pick one skill to master in MMA or fighting, it's wrestling because wrestling. If you're superior at one thing and it's wrestling, you should be able to get get by in any fight or any MMA fight. Do you think that's accurate? I agree. I agree. If you can, if you. If you take like a cage or a boxing ring out of the equation, let's just say that we're fighting in the street. If I can take somebody down, I mean, I obviously have the upper hand. Uh, or if you can 
you can hold somebody down. I mean, you're kind of winning the fight. So I would say wrestling is the best base just for the simple fact of you can dictate where the fight goes, essentially. Man, I need to get some wrestling down, man. I could do some angle slams and <laughs> that kind of wrestling, but I'm trying to learn the double legs and the single leg shoots, you know. <laughs> Um, Dome cold stunners and rock <laughs> bottoms, yeah. baby. I got my people's elbow down, but my single leg shoot isn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we break down the card, I'm going to get into this uh, hypothetical question. Uh, is there, let's say, we're, we're in some kind of reality where we're testing humans against animals as far as <laughs> fighting do you think do you think you could take down as far as animals versus humans go would you think you'd be able to fight I'm trying to think maybe a chimp I think you could take a chimp 101 in the octagon <laughs> No not at all <laughs> I mean I could probably take him down but I mean this is far I mean I could ankle pick him but I mean no, not happening. <laughs> uh-huh. How big can a chimpanzee be? Like, how, how many pounds are they? Do they weigh? I don't think I they get the chimps too are big. the smaller ones, right? Yeah, they, they don't think they get too big, but they're freakishly strong. Like, they could tear your nose and like ears off. Which, I mean, you'll let go of that Just rear naked like, after that. Eat your face off. <laughs> I think as humans, we have morals where most animals don't. So I think animals would always, almost always, have the upper hand just because. Morally speaking, in a fight for survival, they're not they're not gonna have that Jungle, moment. Baby. All right, how about this? Yeah, dude. You know, you know when Peter fights the chicken on Family Guy, <laughs> <laughs> and he like he lets the chicken live. The, I mean, if that was real life, the chicken would not let him live. You know. That's true it's too. True. Yeah. So how about this? Let's rephrase the question. Let's go up to food chain of uh, apex predators. Fuck a kangaroo up. What? Yeah. What apex predator? Uh, uh, as far as like how high in the food chain can you take out and which apex predator would that be? Uh, <laughs> really into birds. So I, I think prepared correctly, I could take on a, a decent sized bird. Like an ostrich. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy. I've been doing fucking ostrich the fuck out. <laughs> Damn. I think when you get into bipedal animals, it's probably where you got to draw the line. Hmm. Like kangaroos would kind of make you nervous but, if it's squared up. Oh, dude, I watched this video the other day. These two kangaroos fighting on this lady's patio, and they absolutely <laughs> fucking annihilated it. <laughs> I just think if there was a human, I mean, it would have it just been drugged to the depths of hell, you know? <laughs> I've seen some buff kangaroos online, man. Yeah, That's man. Scary. They they look like they have their own martial arts too. You know, the kangaroos. <laughs> they have a style of fighting. Uh, yeah. And they would run the yard. <laughs> it's fucking weird. All right, let's break down the card because this card's gonna be crazy. Um, first card. Well, yeah. well, let's let's check out the uh, the undercard. I don't really know much of the undercard because it's been eclipsed by the main card. But I'm just gonna look it up real quick. We're talking about UFC 280, correct? UFC 280 280, 281 It's going to be fire So we got Caitlin Chukagan And Manon Fiora um, And then we got Benel Darius and Matus Gamrot um, Matus Gamrot Kind of made a name For himself recently As far as I mean I'm concerned I haven't really been aware of his rise to um, to the top contenders of the lightweight division, but I kind of feel bad for Benil Dariush on this one. I feel like he got jip. What do you think? Um, well, first off, Caitlin Chukagian is who I'm picking to, to beat uh, Manon Fleureau. Just for the simple fact, Caitlin, um, when I'm in New York, I train at Sarah BJJ and um, Caitlin's out of there, and uh, you know I love those guys. Mm. Um, except fucking Alja, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, I like Caitlin for that fight. I like Benil Dariush for this fight actually, because 
um, where Gamro is like great grappling. Benil's also like a, a world champion jujitsu fighter, but Benil also has scary stand up that we got to see against like Drakkar close, and he ended up mm-hmm. piecing up Tony a couple times. So I think Benil takes it just because that little striking advantage. Right, and um, it'll be a good fight. It'll be it'll be a good grappling match. Yeah, well, I wouldn't like you said. I agree with you with the stand up too. Uh, people are sleeping on a Darius knockout prop. I feel like that's that's highly possible. So, I'm pretty sure the payout for that for that prop would be pretty good as well. Um, as, soon as, even. as soon as we disconnect, I'm gonna go make that bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm with I'm with it. I lost a. Uh, I lost a hundred bucks on the Grasso fight, man. I thought Grasso was in a slip on Saturday, but sheesh. I'm not she's, mad. I lost the bet. Solid, but she, she's cool, you know. But damn it. <laughs> yeah, she's solid. Um, that that weight division's kind of weird right now. With uh, what's your face? I forget her her name. Valentina. Jan- not Valentina. Um, the weight class below that. Oh, um, Carla, Carla, Esparza. Carla Esparza. Yeah, is um, she's yeah. she's set up to fight Wei Li soon, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I think Wei Li is definitely gonna have a, a very easy night. Yeah, it might be the the start of her her reign actually. The Wei Li era. Um, but let's get into it. Sean O'Malley, Peter Yan. This might be the fight of the night, man. And damn, looking at the record, they're pretty close in comparison. Fifteen and one, and sixteen and three. It's not bad. What do you think of um? Even when you, Sean O'Malley's loss to Cheeto. Are you counting that, or, or he's tripping on that one? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. He's so uh, funny with even, that. Even <laughs> so, you you mentioned a second ago if you if you look at their if you look at their records their records are very similar but look at their level of competition though good uh, point they are young 16 and 3 and and he's he's fought top tier people i mean even i mean he fought an aging Uriah Faber who went on to knock out Ricky Simone right after that mm-hmm. um and then you know Jose Aldo who just made a resurgence at 135 and uh you know Corey Sanhagen mm-hmm. Aljo the first time i mean I think Peter Yon's as legit as they get. If Sean O'Malley wins this fight, it's going to be... Uh, Shortcut City, uh, man. Ah, uh, man, I don't I don't really know how Sean could win the fight, honestly. I think Yon's pressure is just going to be too much. Yeah, I feel I'm like... i say it's probably going to be a decision. A, a good fight to reference would be the Sanhagen fight because I think Sanhagen... Might be the more disciplined striker between him and Sean O'Malley, and they're about similar dimensions as far as height and reach goes. And Peter Young negated that. I was impressed with how he he put the pressure on Sanhagen, pretty much matched Sanhagen as far as the striking goes, despite the uh, the difference in in height and in and, and length. I know Corey's lost to Aljo, TJ, and and Peter Yan, but Corey's actually my dark horse for that division. I think Corey's is likely going to capture the title and have a very nice reign once he gets it. But um, I think Peter Yan's probably going to lean on some grappling himself. I I don't think he knocks out Sean. I think it's probably going to be a decision for Peter. Man, I was surprised that. The grappling I saw between Peter Yan and Aljo, the first one, I didn't see that in the second fight. And, like, I was so confused by that. Not at all. Right? Like, he was, he was shutting Aljo down in every aspect of that fight in the first fight. In the second fight, I don't know if Peter Yan just decided not to train his grappling because he just underestimated Aljo, and that's all Aljo worked on. But that was surprising to see, so... Um, it'd be cool to see that version of Peter Yan, you know, doing trips on Sean, taking him down with that scissor sweep that he does. And then we go to, I, I, I have no horse in this race. I, I don't care for both, Aljo and TJ Dillashaw. I'm actually down for a double KO, you know? 
<laughs> I actually taught Bang Muay Thai in, in Florida, and uh, you know TJ's very close to Dwayne and in uh, the whole Bang system. I'm always gonna ride for TJ. Uh, I hate that he failed the drug test. I hate, I hate, I hate drug cheats. Yeah. Um, but I think I think he served his time. I think he came back. I think Corey Sanhagen, even though TJ won the Sanhagen fight, I mean Corey mauled him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think TJ is just going to be a little bit sharper than Aljo. I think he's. I don't know that he knocks Aljo out, but I'm. I'm almost going to say he probably knocks Aljo out. Probably, if you want to really bet money on it, it's probably going to be that left high kick. Yep. I agree with that. Um, it's either a TJ knockout or a decision, or an Aljo decision or sub. I don't think it goes. Um, Aljo KO. Which, you know, I might eat my words next week. <laughs> Tends to happen when I, when I put it out there. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Aljo eats that same kick that Marais hit him with if TJ delivers that. TJ throws that kick a little. Mm-hmm. Right over the shoulder. Yeah, it, it might not be as hard as Marais throws it, but he hides it a little better because of that Muay Thai, that bang Muay Thai system. Very good fight, I think. This is... Um, this is a really good puzzle for both men to figure out. Yeah, if I'm, I, I I'm I'm all about Corey Sanhagen too, and I'm I'm trying to see this from Corey Sanhagen's point of view. If if I was next for the title shot, who who would I want to win? I'd probably go with TJ because I felt like I he won that first Honestly, fight, yeah. so he'll do, he'll he'll make the adjustments. But let's go back to Peter Yan. Dude, I totally forgot um, Peter Yan pieced up Sonya Dong, right? In, in that 16 win record. Sonya Dong is a pretty... He's he's an underrated fighter in the in the featherweight division. I didn't know he used to fight bantamweight, but let me double check that. Um, that fight with... I bring, bring up Sonya Dong. Because of the Corey Sanhagen fight. Dude, what a fucking Terminator that guy is, right? Right. The guy, uh, that was a Bantamweight fight. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Between, between Song Yong and, and Sanhagen. Sanhagen cuts people open some, somehow. He had TJ leaking. He had Song uh, leaking. Um, I mean, Corey's a bad motherfucker, man. <laughs> Yeah, Song's tough. Song's as, as tough as they come. Yeah, he is. And I think, I don't know if he knocked him out, but he got a knockdown on him, which is pretty impressive because, yeah, he's he's a tough motherfucker. He had him opened up, and like I kept walking through like a Terminator. Um, and in the fucking main event, man. Uh, Dr. Stoppage. Yeah, it was. It was Dr. Stoppage, which was a good thing. That night was crazy. The doctor was... It was <laughs> that doctor was cool as fuck, man. Because <laughs> he was working overtime that night. Because cool. uh, Rodriguez had the fucking big ass vagina on his forehead. Dude, that's probably the gnarliest cut ever. If we yeah, if we, if we clip this somehow, I'm gonna put that up on the screen. But that's probably the worst cut I've ever seen. I thought it was um, Cyborg versus uh, Michael Venom Page. I thought that was the worst cut, but this one. This one gives that one a run for its money. That or uh, Alistair Overeem's fucking lip <laughs> against Rosenstrike. That was nasty. Dude, it happened like the oh, last dude. 10 seconds of the fight. <laughs> it's terrible. This main event. This main event is what dreams are made of. Oh, man. You know what? I thought this was a close fight, this main event, up until I heard what Oliveira said. He said something about... Um, Charles is here because he's beating all the contenders. He beat Poirier, Chandler, Gaethje. The only reason Islam is here is because he's riding the Khabib wave. So I agree. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, like internally, I had a, it resonated with me, and I do agree a hundred percent. So that kind of took back my analysis because I thought this was a you know a pick 'em fight, but. I, I'm kind of giving this one to Oliveira now, man. We got to stop doubting. The, down in the champ he has a name 100 <laughs> percent, 100 percent. i agree 100 percent. i think nobody has hit islam as hard as charles will 
mm-hmm. nobody's going to be as comfortable on their back as Charles is going to be. I think Charles might openly, uh, he might he might be waiting for that takedown. You know what I mean? Like he might that might be his dream come true is being on his back with Islam in his guard. Mm-hmm. I think Islam gets subbed very yeah. quickly. Probably a, I'm gonna say probably an arm bar. I think I don't think I think we fight his way out of a triangle, but I think the arm bar is gonna be there. I think it happens like the Kevin Lee fight, man. I think he waits for that oh. takedown and snatches that guillotine, bro. I'd love that. I'd love <laughs> it if he just put his lum to sleep. <laughs> Cause his lum, the thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Dan Hooker, right? Dan Hooker's probably the. His his most high marquee win. Yeah, I mean, you could say the Bobby Green fight because Bobby took it on short notice and Bobby was like streaking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dan Hooker's the highest. Uh, well, Drew Dober too. Drew mm. Dober trained with with Gaethje. Um, but yeah, Dan Hooker's the biggest win of. Um, Islam's career, and that was that was short notice as well. Yeah, so, it was. I think I think Charles Oliveira. I mean, look at his fucking record, man. I mean, uh, what is it, thirty three and eight? Yeah, man, that guy's. So, been I mean, around. he's he's been around the block, man. He's he's seen some shit, you know. He's like that guy in prison that's already been there for five years. Yeah, knows look, exactly like the young dude <laughs> who's fought everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean. Uh, and Charles just recently, I don't know if you know this, he got his eyes fixed. He used to wear glasses. Now he, he doesn't wear glasses anymore. Oh, um, man. So I don't, I don't know how that's going to benefit. I mean, he said that in the Gaethje fight, he's seen three Justin Gaethjes. He just tried to hit the middle one. So, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean he, and he, he really did. He clipped Gaethje. So... I just I don't think Islam's ever been hit by anybody that hard, and I don't think the pedigree of uh, submission grappling. I mean, it's I mean the most submission wins in UFC history. Yeah, and I mean, that guy is not intimidated by anyone. He's fought literally, like I said, he's fought everyone. He's fought Pettis, Holloway. Um, he's literally fought Cowboy. This dude, like. It's just Everybody. A, it, yeah, it's just a face in front of him. It doesn't really matter what the name is. It's a, it's a style of fighting that's in front of him. And, I mean, if I was Charles Oliveira, I'd be looking at Islam like, dude, I've I worked my way to be here, you know? You were just given this because of your homeboy. I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, you just said it 100%. Um, Islam... The biggest marquee win he has is Dan Hooker, and before that you have Bobby Green. Or sorry, uh, most recently you have Bobby Green, then Dan Hooker, then Drew Dober, who are all great fighters, but they're not top five, top fifteen, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and you look at Charles. Charles took clean shots from Justin Gaethje in Arizona, in Justin's home state, trying to take off Charles' head. He ended up coming back, and when he he gets in this traditional tie stance. You ever notice when he, he and that front, that front comes leg? Up. Yep. Yeah, man. He gets <laughs> fucking nasty. Before that, it was it was uh, it was Dustin Poirier. It was old DP, dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, DP laid it fucking on Charles in the first round, and Charles just I don't know if he went to his corner and hit a fucking quick revive or what, dude. Right. But he he came out and, and put it on Dustin. Yeah, uh, I recently I watched that fight. He was. Charles is getting hit with some bombs, man. I'm surprised he didn't get knocked out cold. Um, yeah, it was fucking every frying pan under the kitchen sink, then the actual kitchen sink, mm-hmm. like a neighbor neighbor's dog. I mean, nothing is going to stop Charles. Got hit with Lager. some hot sauce, too. Got, hit, got, hit, <laughs> got fucking sauce, boy. <laughs> Um, no, the, I got I got Oliveira though. I think I think Oliveira is gonna be the greatest lightweight of all time. The craziest thing about Oliveira was when um, Gaethje said when he got hit by Oliveira, he said he had never felt that before. He said his tongue went like stiff. He felt like he put his tongue on a car battery. He got hit so hard, and so I rewatched that fight insane. and I looked back at what shot he was talking about, dude. And it was like the first right hand Charles threw in like ten seconds of the fight. 
And like you said, in Arizona. Striking is so clean. Dude, that's Gaethje, bro. Gaethje eats, like, haymakers for breakfast, you know? Hammers. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's very yeah. telling. So. Yeah, it was, it was a... It was a very crazy fight to watch as a... Uh, I'm a Justin Gaethje fan. Now, I was like, you know what? We have to give this guy respect now because he truly has went through the top five of the division and never complains and just says, all right, whatever. The Mike Chandler fight. The Mike Chandler fight might be my favorite Charles Oliveira fight. He got really tested, really tested, and then came back and fucking annihilated. Chandler is a G for taking that loss on the chin. Bro was so close to being a UFC champ. That would have that would have put him in the talks of being the greatest man. I love Mike, but uh, yeah, that was. Gosh, he fun- I, can you even say he fumbled the bag on that? Because I mean, he did everything in his power and could not get Oliveira out of there. Yeah, that was Oliveira's time. I think that's one of those times where like. You're you're on the same level with someone, and then all of a sudden something happens, and you look over, and he's just on Super Saiyan mode, and it's like, what, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> His hair is all yellow too. You're, just, <laughs> you're running a race with somebody, and you're side by side, and then just when you think you're pulling ahead, they just fucking sprint to the finish line. <laughs> For real. I mean, <laughs> um, it's I always, a sport though. That's that's the sport. I always wondered, and I don't know if you know, but I'm gonna ask you. Um, do you know what's up with that little pet rock that Charles Oliveira has in his post-fight celebrations? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I don't know. I know what I know what you're referring to. I would assume it's probably something from the favela. Oh, okay. I wonder if. But it's that's that's. I mean, that's as far as guesses go. I mean, that's that's all I could come up with. I always wondered. Might, might be, be it might be a fucking pet rock, dude. <laughs> Might be a lucky charm. He, he might have a little leash for that thing and everything, dude. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Some kind of a Santeria. Some kind of Brazil magic. It's funny. Whatever it is, dude, it's working. <laughs> dude, um, like I said, I went to Disneyland early last week. Um, wanted to say this. You're an MMA fan, so you would appreciate this. Uh, I was in line for one of the Disneyland rides, the Star Wars ride, right? And right in front of me, bro, this little short dude with a big bald head, I see a Mighty Mouse just chilling there with his kids and his, like, a training partner. Oh, shit. Nobody around recognizes him, right? So I fucking see him, and I get all excited, whip out my phone, and his training partner looks at me and goes, no, don't do it. I'm just like, fuck, should I do it? You know? And I'm (laughs) looking at him, it's like Mighty Mouse and his training partner's like, bro, these dudes will fuck me up if I do something that they don't like. <laughs> so I was just like, oh man, I'm just gonna let this one go. Respect respect their privacy, you know? But damn it. It'd be more subtle with it. Like, <laughs> yeah. He, t- he, totally, he totally saw me whip out my phone, like, I'm about to take a video of Mighty Mouse. And they're probably thinking, like, you know, nobody recognizes us if you put this up. Probably bust up their. Yeah. Their cover. <laughs> Their cover, yeah. But dude, Mighty it's Mouse. Cool, man. Mighty Mighty Mouse is the goat. Yep. I'd say Mighty um, Mouse is the goat, man. If everyone was the same size in the same weight class, it'd be Mighty Mouse that would come up on top. But it's just not 100%. like that. So John Jones comes out on top. And you. <laughs> you look at what Mighty Mouse is doing over in one. I didn't mean to cut you off, ahead. So no, sorry. <laughs> that was just a comment. Um, no, you look at what Mighty Mouse is doing over in over in Singapore right now. I mean, he's taking on literal Muay Thai world champions and and beating them. I mean, he and he looked good in in the in the Muay Thai aspect of that fight. So, dude, I thought um, he was gonna knock, I thought he was gonna knock out Rotang. I thought he was gonna knock him out. I, I genuinely thought so too. Crazy, right? <laughs> he buzzed him. Yeah, he did. He, he had to have buzzed him. Which, it's an advantage because Rod Tank's probably expecting the takedown, so that overhand's going to be open. But, dude, a knockout would have been crazy under his belt. 
Yeah, he, uh, that's the goat, man. That's, that's more than definitely the goat. And it's a shame that we didn't appreciate him when we had him, because now he's kind of like Aang, the last airbender. Now that he's gone, we fucking need him back, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, you think he comes back, and if he does come back, you think he he puts away uh, Figgy and Moreno with no problem? Uh, I th- Figgy and Moreno seem to be in like a league of their own at Flyweight. Whereas before we used to just have uh, DJ, he was like a, in a league of his own at flyweight. Now we have two guys that have kind of pulled ahead. Um, I think Marino. Here's the thing: is I thought Figgy was going to be pound for pound number one. Like mm-hmm. when Figgy knocked out Joey B, like fucking twice, like smoked him twice. I was like, this dude's going to pull away as like the pound for pound number one. Mm-hmm. Um. And then Marino comes back from fucking LFA and just Makes he shows us what's up. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I think some of the... Because I, I genuinely looked at Figgy at one point like he was like the Terminator. Mm-hmm. Nobody could hurt him. Nothing could touch him. Now, Brendan Marino has proved that, that like, I was very wrong and um, has humanized Figgy in a lot of ways. 100%. And I think that if... I think if DJ was to fight Figgy... Um, I, I don't know. I think if DJ fought Figgy, DJ would have an easier time with Figgy, as opposed to like Brenda Marino. Hmm. Um, but I think overall, I think Figgy's probably the, the more skilled between himself and Fig. And uh, sorry, I think Figueroa's the more skilled between him and Marino. But Marino has such a dog in him that what hmm. he lacks in maybe skill or experience, he just makes up for. In fucking like gangster, you know. Dude, he KO'd. Kai Kara France. Who does that, bro? That's nuts. Oh, man, that <laughs> body kick. Yeah, so clean. So clean, man. And I mean you're a Muay Thai you're a Muay Thai coach. That that body kick was thrown pretty naked. There wasn't really a setup to that, right? It's fucking haymaker. Not at all. Body he just, kick. Yeah. He slung it too. <laughs> like he slung it from the hip, bro. Just winged it. Full send. I mean, sometimes when you full send shit, I mean, it, the reason people say full send, you know. <laughs> All right. We hit an hour and 15 minutes talking about UFC 280, and that's coming out this weekend. I'm going to release this podcast this week, so it's current. Um, Josh, any social network or um, social media, social network accounts you want to plug in on the sign out? Um. Yeah, man. First off, thanks for having me, guys. And um, to Savon, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that I just rambled so much. <laughs> no, 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 it's our pleasure, that. man. We want to hear more about what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> thanks um, for coming through, though. At Thomas Josh on Instagram, it's J A W W S H uh, on Instagram. It has like pretty much all the links. Uh, we, a couple of my friends and I have started a clothing company called the Homegrown Fight Company, and uh, nice. it's we got some pretty cool shit. Um, follow my podcast, Homegrown, the podcast, or the Homegrown MMA show, or just uh, follow the Weekly Forecast podcast on Apple and Spotify. Um, if you're on the Twitch channel, make sure that you subscribe to Cave Podcast. And uh, give your host and co-host to follow. Make sure you do. And that's Homegrown Podcast. We'll put the socials up on the details. And thanks for coming on, Josh. It was fun. Let's hope Let's hope those bets hit, man. Guys. Daryush with the KO. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> a, <laughs> let's do it. I'm going to go place that shit right now. <laughs> Same. All right, guys. Take it easy. Have a good one. Thank you. Later. Thanks Peace for out. coming.